I'm Louise Hamlin, a professor in the Studio Art Department. And before we begin, let me ask you to please turn off all your devices. It's very distracting when the lights or the rings happen in the middle of a talk. Um, our speaker has just said she's going to turn off hers, so <laughs> everybody can turn those off. Also, for those of you who are not aware of our Artists in Residence program, the studio art faculty here invites an artist to come and spend a whole term here. We give them an apartment to live in and a studio on the third floor of this building, and most importantly, time to just focus on their work away from some of the many distractions of being at home. Uh, for students, it's a chance to see how much work goes into <laughs> being an artist, because you'll see through the window over the side entrance is the window to her studio, which the lights will probably be on a lot. Um, and you get to hear her talk about it, you get to see the work itself, and if you want to meet with Judy Glansman, you can send an email to artist in residence and set up a date and she will come talk to you in person. This is a rare opportunity to connect with artists um, who otherwise inhabit a totally different and pretty unapproachable world. So, um, and please join us right after this uh, lecture for the opening of our exhibition over in the hop in the Jaffe Freedy Gallery, and you get a chance to say hi to her there. Um, although she will be in our uh, small rural setting for a whole term, Judy Glansman's world is actually very large. In addition to her group shows every year and all over, she's had several solo shows in Germany as well as all across the United States and most frequently in New York City where she works and lives and where she's been represented for many years by the Betty Cunningham Gallery. In 2009, she had a 30-year retrospective with the Dactyl Foundation, also in New York City. And her work is found in many public collections, the Whitney Museum and the Gray Art Gallery in New York, the Phoenix Art Museum in Arizona, and the Tampa Museum in Florida, to name but a few. Among other awards, she's received grants from the Anonymous Was a Woman Foundation, the New York Foundation for the Arts, the Pollock Krasner Foundation, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She's taught at the Rhode Island School of Design, where she got her own BFA, and the New York Studio School. She shares with students everywhere a marvelous appetite for materials and experimentation. A group of her drawings, for example, were made with graphite, ballpoint, Sharpie, acrylic paint, oil paint, gesso, chalk, walnut ink, India ink, and watercolor. She's maintained a remarkable immediacy in her work, due in part to her love of mark in both two dimensions and three, and a lushness of touch that mirrors her enduring engagement with the psychological realities of life. Most recently, these realities have been war and racism. In the preface to his 2013 interview with her, Arthur Pena wrote that, quote, to know Judy, a wonderful and generous artist and teacher, one has to reconcile her kind spirit with her absolutely gruesome work, end quote. He was referring to her 2013 mixed media show at Betty Cunningham that addressed the horrors of war. Simultaneously sophisticated and untamed, her urgency becomes ours. Looking at her work, we are plugged with a jolt into her talent, her rage, her energy, her devotion, her social conscience, and above all, the expressive power of art. I'm so glad Judy Glansman is out there and now up here. She's an important sizzle, brought sometimes to an exuberant boil on the often insular surface of the art world. Please join me in giving her a heartfelt welcome. Should we touch that? I think down. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you so much. What an opportunity. Um, so I just got here a couple of days ago. And um, I think what we're going to do today is I'm going to talk very quickly. I, it's my usually my, uh, my way. And just try to go through a lot of images, giving you a kind of a progression of the work. And then uh, Lewis Payton, who wrote the catalog essay, and I will have a little conversation, and, and you can ask questions. So this is a picture of me. I'm the 
I'm, not, I'm six years old, and this is the San Juan Star. My family moved to Puerto Rico, and we lived there for four years. Um, and the, the quote was, Grave Judy said, just give me my brush. My mother is an artist. She died, actually, this year. And um, I'm, what I realized about my mother is that her relationship to abstract expressionism was an incredible impact on me. And when I read um, the biography of de Kooning, I realized how much of the things that I just presumed to have as my own kind of thinking that were really a part of that movement. So the idea of abstract expressionism is that you stand in front of this thing and you react and it's about the experience that you're having. And so for me, and I do teach a lot, so I think about this in terms of teaching, um, when I say to my students that when I begin the work, I'm less interested in um, you know, uh, making a picture that I already know what it is. That it's the exploration at that kind of very fragile precipice between knowing something and not knowing something, that's the point that I like to stop. And that doesn't mean that I always stop, but certainly go over sometimes. But that idea that, it, that you're asking a question, what does something look like? And that's something that's been um, consistent in my work. I, I have um, divided the presentation into work that I did for a long time, probably about 20 years, from my imagination. And in those, I think that the, um, the idea was to sort of as a kind of a psychological self-portrait. This is an image of me in, a, in, Pier, two, in Pier 34. Um, and Pier 34 was uh, conceived by David Wonorovich and Mike Bidlow. Um, it was probably 1981, New York City, a very different kind of place. And there were these piers that were abandoned. I didn't even realize at the point that I um, started to work in there, and we, it was a very democratic situation, and uh, David and Mike just started to invite people who invited people, and so when you went into the pier, it was just a kind of a crazy place where all kinds of artists were making things. And David, who is an extraordinary artist, who'll have a show at the Whitney, a retrospective at the Whitney Museum in June of 18, um, he planted the baby grass. And so in some ways, what you were seeing in here was this kind of simultaneous moment of decay, it almost seemed like at the pier, the, the people that were you know, receiving the boats, they left their ledgers. It's like one day everybody said, just leave the building. And so it was kind of an intense and kind of scary space, but it was a very beautiful, beautiful place and a beautiful thing to be involved in. And having met David and Mike and working at the pier opened up the world of the East Village to me in the, in the early 80s. And so for a little while, I was a part of a group of people. And um, it's a very interesting thing to look back at that work. And some of the work is really being revisited now because of the kind of intensity and rawness and expressionism. So these are four elements that David did. And I um, wanted to show them to you because more recently, I've started to think about making the work as if it's a set of vocabulary. And I didn't really ever thought of David uh, doing that. David is an uh, activist, and he died of AIDS in 1992. And almost all of our friends at that time um, were really impacted our community by AIDS. And, but at this time, David was taking the four elements and then taking the sort of um, psych the, the uh, language that he used, like he almost was making his own vocabulary. And I love the idea of the four elements, and I encourage you to think of something like that, which is a kind of a structure, but it doesn't define the, the, the uh, content. In other words, you could think of those four elements, and they have a kind of a structure, and then you could be free to put your information inside of it. In the show at um, here is some portraits that I did of David. These are just six by six little acrylic paintings uh, when David was, um, I think he was about uh, 12 years old. And what I ended up doing with the paintings, and I've worked on them over a continuous thing, and I often work in series, is that I had a, a color copy that I was working from, but over time, that color co I poured some water on it accidentally, and it started to degrade itself. And I realized that I wasn't really making an image of David so much as a painting of the piece of paper. And for me, that idea that what we make is involved with picture making, but picture making is not the whole thing. So for me, like I said, even if I'm working from a photograph, I hope that the process of working through it in terms of how it gets built materially, uh, what size it is, the kind of formal elements, reveals itself to me in a new kind of way. And so the idea has always been for me that even when these, when they were just basically reacting to things that were going on in my mind, and at this point, I had just finished college, and um, I was having a very difficult time. And then, and what I've always had, you know, told students in terms of advice is the best advice for me was live on nothing. Find a way to live as, as cheaply as you can so that you have the time to work. But the kind of, so I was donated certain enamel paint, plexiglass, and so I was living on very little, but New York is a great uh, resource for garbage. And so you could put things together that way. And so 
at that time, the East Village was a, a great, um, it was a great place for me to be, be because I was able to work very quickly and the materials itself worked very quickly and these were all continued to be working from the inside of my head. The thing that for me, not only do I love this picture, but it's important to me because Peter Hujar took the picture and Peter Hujar, who is also a part of the East Village, although older than us, and a very important part of David's life, um, is going to have a show at the Morgan Library. So the idea that these two people are going to have retrospectives in the museums is almost unfathomable and a very beautiful thing. When the East Village was at its height and I had kind of hit a wall and sort of used up some of my um, uh, interior emotional things, and I, by that I mean that at a certain point if you sort of know what's going to happen at the end, then it's not that interesting to make something. So I made a uh, show. It was called Glansman Cuts Up Her Friends, and it was 66 critics, collectors, other artists, and again, another, th you know, I um. One time I heard Jerry Salt say this, so I always say this to my students, which is basically look around. This is your community. The people that are next to you now probably will be a part of your community, and that's the thing that bowies you and supports you because it's not that easy to be an artist. Um, this is my art dealer, Gracie Mansion, and Freya Hansel, who is an artist. And this is a critic, Robert Pincus Witten, and Sir Rodney Sir was also my art dealer. So the East Village was really from 1980. 1982 to 1985, by 1986, what I thought would be sort of my future, I thought this was going to be the way things were going, and it was a lot of, um, a lot of you know, um, working very hard, but also it was a little bit, not, you know, success over the years for me has been challenging because then you start to sort of produce something, like I said, if you want to make something that you don't know about, taking that risk is not that easy if you're having product. If you feel like you've got a show, I'm not really, I have never been the best for working up to a show like that. So um, 1980, 1991, 1992, like I said, most of the people in the images that you saw before ha had died. It was a decimation of our community. And so uh, I started to make these paintings, still from my imagination. And when I think about that sort of shift from working from an interior way, it was very important for me then to pay attention to how the materials acted. So these paintings, were made over a long period of time. Um, I was very close to David when he died, and I started to feel like, there was a, a, a colleague of mine came to my studio, and she said to me, and the paintings look kind of like the white part of it, and she said to me, you know, Judy, it's hard to see that you work so hard, and you have so much to say, but you, it's so muted. Why don't you just go ahead and let your pictures be, be visible to you? And so I started to return to a kind of figurative element, and I started to think about the way that there were uh, feet that were uncovered is the same as really a kind of an intimate thing, maybe something that you only really see when you're either intimate with somebody in a kind of a, a you know, a, lo a love relationship or if you see them ill. And so these were kind of a way of pulling out certain demons and like I said, they were built over time. So I started to try to kind of speed up the process and that's when I started to distinguish the idea of a subject and then the manner it's it, in which it's made, including everything, the color, the size, the shape, the material the process, and after that, that if you have something, that subject and, the, and that process and materiality come together to make what I'll call content. And so for me, with the content of these, and that's something that I think is consistent throughout my work, I have a compulsion to kind of pick a scab. I have a compulsion to kind of peel away some of the niceties of what, and so these are sort of all dressed up and ready to go. They have their bows, uh, they have their tutus, and they're also kind of, um, you know, it, it was sort of dark and scary looking. Um, and certainly that relationship between childhood and my own childhood traumas involved with, you know, childhood and that idea that you sort of carry this stuff and that you can kind of peel that stuff away and that stuff is already th always there. Um, so the, the painting, this painting shows you a little more of what the surfaces were. I used a lot of linseed oil. Um, my studio mate at the time, Glenn Goldberg, he said to me, he said, Judy, the paintings are crying. So you can see in here, they were just kind of big puscular sores and some of them kind of leaked out. Um, in 1997, I had my daughter and um, so that same kind of idea that I could have, uh, I have all these canvases where they, they were just stuff. They were just stuff on a, on a canvas and I would sort of, she would be napping and I would have about 20 minutes or so and in that 20 minutes I could come in and, and because there's so many layers, because this, this process is, has such a failure rate, but the idea is that I could take this stuff and with a couple of lines I could carve it out and like I said, it's the moment between the paintedness of it and the pictorial element of it. And so um, 
that idea that they were almost becoming or unbecoming, they were revealing and they were concealing themselves. And then I started to miraculously with those paintings have a kind of a, so I had a kind of a really great uh, 1985 area and then 1995 area, that same, same thing, 10 years later, it took me 10 years to learn how to paint again. And some of the stuff that I was learning when I, when I was learning how to paint was how does paint speak, how do colors speak, how does the kind of physicality so that you're not relying on the pictorial image to carry the image. And so one of the processes that I made was something like a big, uh, the, the paintings are big. These paintings are not that different scale from what you're seeing on the screen, a little bit smaller. And so rather than kind of trying to control them and think of worry when I was in the middle of one part, because when I was painting it, I couldn't see the whole, worry what was happening on the bottom of the canvas and trying to limit that, I allowed these things to just kind of build up and uh, make it a kind of an accumulation. And you'll see later in the work that that idea, though these are from made up, not looking at something, and now I do look at things, but that idea that somehow there are pieces and parts and they can accumulate and add a kind of a sentence, but the sentence is something which is not necessarily so fixed. And I showed this one because almost always when I've hit a wall and again started to know what the picture's gonna look like before I completed it, I started to re-look to a mirror of my own self. And so some of them are repeats of images of me standing in a freezing studio in my tutu that I had sewn. Um, I off and on for many years have taught at RISD. And so in 1994, it was a busy year for me and they hired me and so on the train, I took a little, these are nine by 12 Bristol board and um, excuse me, ballpoint or felt tip pen so that I couldn't hide from what I was making. And so it was almost as though my, my goal was to kind of open a little hole and let pour out what was gonna pour out and, the, and, and what is interesting is that the, and this is also consistent that the um, scary images came out but the, it was extremely pleasurable to make them. I was laughing. I love the idea of um, as things being funny in art, and I feel like that they're, um, the absurdity or the dichotomy between them being kind of monster-like and horrific, and at the same time are kind of polite and dressed nicely, often with party hats. So when I was pregnant with my daughter, I got really afraid of using oil paint um, for a little bit. Like I said, I need to have the kind of freedom the rule in my studio is that whatever comes into my head has to be acted upon. And so again, another process that in all likelihood fails more times than it succeeds. But the idea is that I'm looking at or making visible the impulses that are running through my head and most importantly, without judgment. So I started to work on these little sculpty um, sculptures and what I would do is they're all hollow so that I would sort of be able to, uh, if I wanted the nose, I could poke my finger from the inside out or the eyes I could poke it through. And I realized how the physicality of making sculpture was a very liberating thing. And also I don't identify myself as a sculptor and so I had a kind of lot of freedom. But as you can see, some of the pieces I would just, you know, I was putting them in my toaster oven and so clearly it was as toxic as can be, although they're little children's material and I, I loved using children's material. And then I started to think about this Sculpey as a certain kind of a skin color, a very generic skin color, but the more that I burnt them, the more kind of range of people that I began to include in the images that I was making. So these are little Sculpeys. And they're all really scaled to sort of my handheld scale. Um, you know, I, I, um, I have to tell you as I'm going through what's going on in my life, because at this point my father has contracted cancer and my daughter is too. And I realize when I go to my studio that I have no ability to sustain a thought from one time of going there to another time. So again, I made a kind of a process. And the process was, and these are, these are 80 by 90, so they're pretty substantial paintings. And I would stack a couple of stools on top of each other. I would cover the entire canvas cream cheese white. And you began to see things in the, because these were paintings that I was covering other paintings, and in, in a way kind of, taking the color out of it allowed me to actually see the images almost before I made them, like a kind of pentimento. And so sitting on these two stools so that I could not um, separate my contact with this figure, I didn't want to stand away and act like I was sort of in the control situation. I wanted to be as in, 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 uh, in sync with this character that I was making. And I made these kind of paintings for four years, all the same kind of process, covered the thing in white, excuse me, when it was white, it was wet, I went in with a, like a teeny, number six little teeny paint, watercolor paintbrush, and I began to kind of form the figure, and as I said before about becoming and unbecoming, the white of the paint began to suck up the, the color, and so in some ways, 
it was something that I had to kind of not postpone looking at the image. I had to arrive at something. Like the ballpoint pen, I had to accept my own limitations. I think before that, when I wouldn't finish something, I would hope that over time, this sort of magical great painting was gonna come out. And in some ways, as an artist, you have to accept your limitations and actually to grow, you have to look at your limits. Um, so after doing them for so many, so many different times, I started to sort of feel like I was taking on the personality of different artists. And earlier we talked about Alice Neal, and I think of just the blue and the stripes that are, that are in that painting make me think of Alice Neal. A lot of them have a kind of a feeling of Giacometti. My goal was to, and I think with the Giacometti and this thing, I think about a lot in terms of drawing, that as I'm drawing or trying to fix something, in other words, to make it uh, hold its place, I look at something right next to it and it seems to move. And so that activity, not so much the picture of the figure, but the experience of looking and trying to build something and trying to find something that is real. So for me, when I was working from my imagination, I was trying to find these people as really realized as I could. I was, it was almost the opposite. I live in lower Manhattan, 9-11. Uh, um, I went back to my studio and I started to take these various pieces of stationery that I had. And again, without censoring, and it's one of the reasons that I repeat, that I make series or make repetitions of things, is it gives me a lot of freedom within a small context of a, a procedure to make a, as many kind of um, ranges on that, to not limit myself, to not kind of stop myself before I make something visible to myself. After the white paintings, almost at the kind of pendulum super swing, um, and it was really something that I went on a, on a, I was teaching somewhere and I realized I hadn't brought any white paint. So that was the end of that. And um, I started to make these images and it was almost something that I had caught myself not giving myself license in terms of making the figure to just make body parts. I had always sort of felt for some non, not good reason that I had to kind of include the whole figure. And I think part of being an artist is actually finding all those preconceptions that you have. Things that, rules that may be set that have no meaning for you. And then to try to understand where you are in them. Again, 90 by 80. Um, I had a funny thing happen. I was looking at a black and white reproductions of Hieronymus Bosch and I went, wow, Hieronymus Bosch uses a horizon line. And it was a big liberating thing for me to be able to use a kind of horizon line. Especially since I do think of these as being uh, DNA, strings of pearls, um, you know, ancestry, your own ghost, maybe your own head. Maybe it's just, and so this is a teeny painting. This is the size of an index card. And you can see this, the, the kind of surfaces are really built up and really, really um, crusty. And I just love this little painting. And I love the fact that at the end of the whole thing, the moment that it became complete for me was when the little fingers at the bottom became fingers themselves. Also, I had gone to um, Rome and I realized that for me, in terms of being a figurative artist and looking at the greatest figurative art, um, the idea was that the body um, was a kind of a manifestation of a kind of an emotion. And uh, something that's happened as I've grown older is I realized that the body is not such a stagnant thing either. That I sort of thought of the body as the kind of physical form that was a solid thing, but I understand now it's kind of fleetingness. So the idea of combining things, taking one thing and putting it into another, these are sculpy hands. Um, they're easy to build and they're kind of fun to build. And then I would start to make those little heads on them. And so I, I continued to make the sculpture and I continued to make Sculpey. And under the necessity as the mother of invention, um, I wanted to fabricate them really large and I just didn't have the money to do it. And I'm very happy that I didn't have the money because my own half-baked way of making molds was so um, full of flaw. And those flaws were really some of the most beautiful parts. So the bottom parts are molds made from some, super, from some of the other super sculpy heads and it's just a resin that's poured into the, to the latex mold. The thing about them, and it's this I think probably I took the picture so it's not so great, but if you hold them onto the, if you put them on the wall, they glow in a kind of a beautiful way. So again, I wanted to try to make these as real as I possibly could. And so these are made from my imagination, but after the super crusty paintings, I felt like the crust of those things was sort of dictating the way the painting was gonna go and I didn't want that. So you can see that what I would do, which is actually sort of what I'm doing right now, is that I would take a piece of paper towel whenever the surface would start to feel less like a kind of a, a person and more like a piece of paint and kind of pull that surface away. This was one of the first ones and I love this character. So for me, the success of these or the realness of them is the kind of feeling that inside of that body, there's a person and they can see through you. 
And so these are a couple of those. And these are about eight, and eight squared. And like I said, I've always um, continued to make sculpture. You'll see in, in I, some of these, like the gray head is just, um, I didn't really have access to clay, so it's just self-hardening clay. And then the hands are hands that were made from the resin. And then I hit a wall. And I really felt like I understood or I could see the future. I could see every painting I was going to make, and it really was a very unpleasant thing. I went to Spain, and though I had seen um, the Guernica in, at MoMA, something about seeing it there or the moment in time made me realize that what I wanted to do was not to look inward, but to look outward. And the Guernica was so powerful on so many levels, but one of the levels is how simple it is and how domestic it is. And I was very moved by that. And so I started to try to understand. Um, I thought I was trying to understand what war would look like to me. But the more that I made the images, the more I realized that um, it, I had never been to war. And probably my closest experience of war, because I'm Jewish, have to do with you know the Holocaust and hearing about that from my family. But the idea of having, like I said before, the kind of pulling of a scab, the idea of having um, an awareness, like when my friends were dying of AIDS, that the whole world is acting in a kind of a normal way, but right under the surface, there's a whole other thing going on. And here we are, we're around the world, we are engaged in, in, in a lot of brutality. And I just want to show you that the little sepia drawing in there, I would draw still. I had to kind of come up with a strategy for how to not be in my studio all the time and continue to make work. And so I started to make accumulations of things that made me think about war teeth and skulls and, and guns, and then I would come back and I would collage them back in. These are a little bit different. These, this is a teeny little painting, and what I would do with these paintings, these are acrylic because I've now moved back to my home it, rather than in my other studio where I used oil paint, and I would take a piece of a canvas that was store-bought and I would mount a piece of paper on it but kind of raggedy cut it around the edges. And then I would try to understand what would war look like to me. And sometimes what I realized was they were as much about mourning as they were about war. These are some of the bigger collage pieces. And in these, you can see some of the little heads made from the super sculpy heads. But these are paper mache. They're really made of toilet paper. And I would take the, uh, my, because I just love the way the toilet paper looked. And I would just put some polymer medium and then put it on the heads and then pull them off. And, um, and return to a kind of a, a combination of a three-dimensional and two-dimensional. And so this is a, I feel like um, not only because of teaching, but maybe because of it in part, that I am an educator of my own. And so I have started to copy a lot of work. So these are little Goyas. A friend of mine had given me all the washes that Goya had made as preliminaries for the disasters of war and the capriccios. And Sometimes I would just sit down, and again, I knew that the project was finished when, the, when I finished the book. And I didn't really aspire. I love Goya. Um, I don't think that I am Goya, and I do love to draw a lot. But I also felt like, in some ways, just copying gave me a kind of a muscle memory. After the show, there was a show at the Metropolitan on the Civil War. And there were some amazing paintings. This is a painting by Winslow Homer, and it's called Dressing for the Carnival. And the more I looked at that little painting, something drew me to it, and I decided to look at this painting and make that the kind of thing that I was going to study. And the more I looked at it, the more I noticed that the little children are carrying little American flags. Um, the woman that works at the gallery, she's an art historian, and she started to tell me what actually was the story of the picture. But I actually have a little bit, sometimes, information of hers, and I felt like that this idea of they're all dressed up. It seems to be maybe 4th of July, but the costumes are maybe costumes from you know something other than American and a kind of a collision. I love the way that the, that the children were climbing up on one another. And it, it was my first sort of introduction to how I might be able to talk about race in, in the work. Um, I realize now that it really isn't race that I'm interested in talking in so much as racism. Um, but that was something that took a long time for me to kind of develop. And so what I was going to, like with these ones, the process was I would take those same store-bought little canvases cover them with acrylic paint and for some reason make do it with my hand and so that it was a kind of a surface underneath it and the reason that uh, why I did that is because I wanted to take fragments in the painting I wanted to understand the painting in any way I could and one of the ways of understanding it was to take little pieces of the painting and the figures themselves became kind of emblematic so this is the uh, it's not a great image, but this is the, uh, at one end were the set of fragments, and then this is at the other end, which is just the repetition, repetition, repetition of those images until they make something else. Um, there was a show of a, 
it was called the, Muse the Museum of B Biblical Art. They closed right after this, and they were able to get um, uh, from the, um, the Duomo in, um, I think it's in Florence, and they were able to get these Donatellos. The other, the one is Donatello and one is Nano de Banco. And I decided to, again, take those images and literally work from them. And these are sort of my iterations. But one of the things that I love about these, these are about um, three quarter regular size, but they, the, the uh, canvases on them are paintings that I had made from a long time before. And I really love these little sculptures. And they helped me, and I made a lot of little sculptures, all from referencing the Donatellos. So I've always worked from um, observation. And um, I started to, like I said, I'd hit a wall, and it was almost like refeeding. And so when I was making work from observation, I was starting to think about the thing that I try to begin to talk about in terms of David, that there would be elements that I could use that would be emblematic, and they would be almost like letters. And if I put them together, I could start to see a meaning in the work that I didn't really know when it began. I would learn something from my own work. So the skull became one, and the gun became another. This is, um, this is um, Garabedian. Charles Garabedian, and he showed at Betty Cunningham. This painting is actually bigger in reality than the painting that, that the image that you're seeing in here. And I was so struck by the little, by the canoe and the woman going off in that canoe, maybe a man, that it had a sense of, of you know, going off, like the kind of a, um, a funereal sense. And I thought that was really a beautiful thing. And so this is part of something that I've been working on for a very long time, like two years, a kind of a collage thing of piecing things together and taking them apart. Part of the thing, I think, in making work, I mentioned risk, but also there's loss. And so there was a lot of images that I really loved, little drawings, but that once they came into this thing, they sometimes would just fall on the floor and become garbage. Um, Linda Barry is a cartoonist, and she described art as an equivalent to a baby with her blanket. And the idea that the physicality of the materials is inert, is nothing, but at some point it takes on a life of its own. And that quality, and that's a very hard thing to name. And sometimes for me, when in the, I'm in the middle of making something, these are just fragments, that I could say, OK, that's the moment to stop now, because it's a precious, fragile moment where the thing is literally in the transition between something which has a kind of physicality and something which has a kind of a meaning. So I, Pearl Paint was closing, and they had a little canoe kit. And so I actually made my own little canoe and um, the bird. And then so I started to think about the elements as being these pictorial elements, even emblematic, those that are just physical surfaces, like the, the yellow with the splash of paint. And, um, and then the kind of things of being torn and put together. And those were the kind of elements that had a kind of conversation. You know, it's funny because I've always made three-dimensional things. And something about, and, and even in the last couple of days when I've set up the studio, I realized that I have very different sets of energies. And I need to have work that kind of accomplishes different things. And that these, which are carved um, out of branches of wood, um, were, were kind of a very, uh, were very um, physical. And like I mentioned, my mother died in April. And I, and I do think that they're kind of coming up from the ground. And I really thought, I, I didn't think I was making anything about my mother. But the feeling of the hands themselves are literally my mother's hands. So when I included the globe and then the flowers, the flowers always seem to have a kind of a, a life force. And they almost always came at the end. Um, this is one of them that Lewis wrote about in the essay, and this, it, when I was making this, like I said, I never know when it's going to be finished. Um, and I had put these kind of heads in, but when I stepped away, I realized that it made a, a large, a, like a, it was made of parts, but it also made one kind of a large head as well. So it's been something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, you know, w what images can be in the public domain, and I really, really miss Obama, and it is such a sad time, I think, and um, so in some ways I thought, well, I can make images and I can, and I can take people who are kind of heroic to me and let them sort of act in the picture. And so you can see a little David is in here in the little canoe. This is probably the densest one. Um, and so these are some of the more recent ones where you see some of those elements that are combined and then taken apart and put back together. So when I was again back to teaching and I have a very dear friend, Dawn Clements, really wonderful artist. And she said to me, because I would always go with little things to work on, and she said, you know, Judy, if you want to work on something big, you could just fold it up, put it in your bag, work on some part of it. And so all of the kind of drawings that are like non-water based, I made on the train. And so I kind of had a sense, it's not like I, this is called Missing Obama. Um, I had a sense of what they might be like. But um, 
I didn't, um, I would sort of have an, I, and so one of the things that I started to do with them is to think about borders or things that would go in the center, like structures that I could know and keep in my head without worrying where things were going to relate to one another. And, um, and this is the series that I've just, these are some of the works that I'm starting to work on in here. One of the things about the small heads, and I think it is something about the kind of uh, shift from scale, is you'll see one of the little sculptures in the show. The sculptures that I made for these are very small handheld sculptures made from photographs, but the images themselves were much larger. And that's the end. So thank you. So now. Uh, Do we get the lights on? Yeah, you have to turn the lights on uh, so I can see it down. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that was fast. It was fast? Judy um, speaks fast. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I'm originally from Texas. I think you know that. And I just got back from Texas, so I don't speak as fast as Julie speaks. So you'll have to bear with me. And I'll, um, I'll tell you, I wrote the essay. Judy, uh, a friend of mine is... I was really good friends with Judy, and she called me and she said, listen, um, Judy wants you to write the introduction to a catalog of sh uh, a show she's doing at Dartmouth. And I said, Judy must be out of her mind. Doesn't she know that I don't, I don't know? I'm not, a, I'm not an artist in that way. I'm a writer, but and not that a writer's not an artist, but I, I think that maybe she wants someone else. This friend of mine said, no, no, she wants you to write it. And I thought, okay. So I, I will tell you that um, I saw some of the work that you see in the gallery here, and I was terrified to write this. So I, I'll tell you a little story. I just saw my niece, who just informed us that she dropped out of college. And don't do that, by the way. <laughs> um, so she, she said, I just don't understand. I don't understand what life is about. And I said, well, you know what life is about? It's about losing things. And you lose a lot of things. And your job is to figure out how to put them back together. That's your job. And that's why life sucks. And that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> and she said, she said, I said, do you feel better now? And she said, well, yeah. She, and actually, she did feel better. And I would have to say, Judy tagged on this in the end of the presentation. And she said, losing things. And I looked at her pieces, and I thought, there's a lot of loss in her pieces, um, a lot of fragments that are being tr put back together in an attempt to make sense out of life. And so you have to ask yourself, if you're in your 20s, uh, you'll be asking yourself this question in, in a, you know, about 10 years. Uh, what am I doing? What am I thinking about? What, why am I here? And all these other, uh, you know, profound questions. So you will have to, an the answer is, you're going to start losing things. And so you have to put them back together. So don't even bother ans ask asking yourself that question, because it's one of mute. Anyway, I will, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read fast, what well, I'm going to try to read fast, uh, this essay, because I want to, I hope that the essay will uh, inform you how Judy's uh, work uh, affects me and how it sort of uh, inspires me as a writer. And um, so, as I said, I looked at a lot of the work, and I sat down, and I freaked out, and I read a lot about writing these types of things, and then I freaked out again. And then I said, OK, well, it's all up here. So um, with the, keep that in mind, that losing things, life is about losing things and, and somehow trying to piece them back together. So I'll start off, and I might skip some of this. But it starts off, and it says 9-11. Those three numbers, three simple numbers, join together to change history, the past, present, and the future, will forever be cemented in our memories. After the attacks, American patriotism presented itself in various ways. The American flag hung not only from the hollowed halls of court and government, but from homes across the country. 
This was a nationalistic effort to ease the shock of the worst terrorist attack ever inflicted on American soil. It seemed like a good thing, but there were others who took a darker view of the circumstances. Violence against Muslims increased tremendously. From the graves of 3,000 souls reignited a, nation, a notion that racism and patriotism are the same. And this form of xenophobia has lasted for 16 years, finally resting its separatist head under the reins of President Trump. Policies ranging from increased surveillance and airport security, the Patriot Act, and other systematic restrictions designed to afflict limitations on certain groups simply because of their race or religious beliefs have caused a distorted interpretation of our country. The death, deaths of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and the never-ending flood of unarmed African-American men who have died in, quote, officer-related shootings the violent consequences of an unresolved history of race relations have largely defined the past years of public discourse in the United States, culminating in the violence of Charlottesville, Virginia. What is race? Blood? Skin? Color? DNA? These are not real. They are fake constructs designed to confuse the masses. Even if one believes that there is no race, there is certainly racism. A close cousin, a relative not welcomed by most, especially in America. Race is as ephemeral as blending colors on an artist's palette. Racism is a coercive belief system that affects us all. No dictionary adequately denotes its purpose it is usually too simplistic. Racism is a complex system of ideas that cannot be described by mere words. This system has been codified, renamed, and reassessed to make it palatable to the masses of people who occupy space in this great country. But this word cannot be adequately defined with letters alone. However, there is one medium that can shed light on this pronouncement, and that is art. Of the countless lenses we've adopted for this nationwide racial reckoning, art is the one we might not typically think of. But here's where the real reckoning lies, in the paintbrush and the pen, in the colors, forms, textures of our desires. How can art help us move closer to understanding one another? How can this medium possess such power of faith? It is in the visual aspect of our existence. We are visual beings and thus depend on photographs, paintings, and films to offer some sort of answer to the ever-increasing nature of our troubled existence. The Confederate flag Robert E. Lee statues, and the many other examples of hate that pervade the geography of the, and mindset of this country are all made clear to us by the visual. So why all the arguments and disagreements when the R word raises its ugly head? There is no easy answer to this question, or there may be no answer at all. So we rely on the gentle yet harsh hands of artists to assist in helping us work through this relationship to understand the social realities of racial divide in America. Art has the means to transcend the obvious and lead us into a world of visceral reactions which encourage us to think outside of our own needs and wants, a world of rational loving and peaceful discourse that contributes to the great American tapestry. It can be a bold endeavor that challenges artists across this nation to take arms with their paintbrushes, pens, and cameras, and move to help our citizens make some sort of sense of this brutal reality. One such artist is Judy Glantzman. 
she views art with a distinct contradiction of life that is both beautifully uplifting and dangerously horrific. It is no wonder that with her unique vision, she chose to approach this controversial issue. She experiments with materials and process using painting, collage, drawing, and sculpture to reflect experiences that define the beautiful insanity of our lives. Judy's work connotes resistance to slavery of the mind. It is freedom in its purest context, and this freedom allows her to present a multitude of imageries that not only express the constraints of our limited society, but also the independence of the mind. To be an artist is to express the autonomy that most people long for, the willingness to, quote, be, to exist in a world of your own, and, not, and to not limit yourself to others' thoughts, but to embrace your own as they apply to your specific beliefs. Judy knows of this world and gives us a glimpse into her psyche, filled with complication and mastery of art form. Her work is bursting with color and expression that hearkens the unabashed self-scrutiny, quote, the inside of her head made visible, end quote. In her latest work, a 15-piece exhibit on racism, Judy presents work, works of art that not only exemplify her free form, some would say abstract, technique, but also present a clear control method that she very much owns. This is a glimpse inside of her mind, a mind that is constantly at war with the injustices that seem to permeate our culture. In this series, she captures an array of emotions, love, hate, fear, anxiety, and sadness. It is expressionistic in context, but never manages to lose its emotionality and connection to the viewer. We are part of her world, and we relish in the multitude of images presented in a collage feast for our eyes. Her reworking style is present here, as it is in all of her work. This is her landmark, her passion, her way of working. This is life. We are a mesh of emotions, of different people, all thrown together in a soupy gumbo of raging cultures that long to understand one another, but are challenged to do so. One work of note is Reach which depicts seven carved wooden hands, a major motif in Judy's past work. Hope is a major theme, and the repetition of hands in all of Judy's pieces is an inspiration to dream for a better future, a future where all races, creeds, and colors may, quote, break bread with each other and feed our differences with understanding instead of hate. Glansman has, Glansman has said that she, quote, learns from going to extremes, excuse me. And another work entitled Barack's Face offers the most extreme images of the series. The painting centers on a face deconstructed and filled with Obama heads, hands, boats, baby shoes, and guns. Surrounding this face are a collage of more guns, and hands, some of them reaching singularly and some of them praying. One could get lost in the bombardment of dark images, but the hands offer us inspiration. Judy's most uplifting piece, entitled Missing Obama, illustrates the possibilities of a world where we question our very existence, our place in society. Obama represented hope for the future of America, a future filled with the possibility of togetherness and marked by the absence of separatist ideals. Sadly, the dream that galvanized our nation to elect its first African-American president has since lost its fervor. This intensity and desire for acceptance of all its all is apparent in Missing Obama. Within layer upon layer of collage, 
this piece examines the complexity of this country and its missed opportunity at hope. But do not fail to miss the hidden message. Hope is rising, and it will soon conquer any semblance of hate and dissension. Hope will always win, and with each stroke, each reworking of images, Judy believes in the sanctity of goodness amidst the anguish of evil. This is reality. This is America. And she chooses to show it in all its bleakness and optimistic potential. Judy never whitewashes, pun intended, her ideas, no matter the subject. She simply presents them as they flow from her mind, a mind filled with the mesmerizing nature of love, spirituality, possibility, and yes, hope. Her work in this series shows that our nation can and will live up to its potential of inclusion of all sexes, races, ethnicities, and the potential, I mean, uh, sexualities and affiliations. We are a nation of people who breathe daily and hope for equality of thought. This is a nation Judy knows well. And in this series, she offers the viewer a chance to examine their own demons and better angels as human beings are encouraged to do in a free society. So that's the essay that I wrote for you, um, knowing nothing about how to write an essay for art, because I simply responded to um, what the image is meant to me. Mainly, as a person, I would say, since the piece is on racism, as a person who grew up in a mostly segregated society in Texas, I approached it and I tried to make sense out of it myself from my own perspective. And my perspective was very simply what I told my niece, that life is about losing and losing and losing and losing. And your job in life is to figure out how to take those losses and to put them back in some sort of construct that makes sense, or else you're doomed. And that's my essay, and that's my theory. So I guess it would be a good time if people have questions or things they want to talk about. I've got a mic. You can ask us anything about life. We have all the answers. <laughs> We're not. From this side of the room. <laughs> yes. I'm wondering how um, Donald Trump is affecting your artwork. You know, um, I read somewhere somebody said just don't even say the name. <laughs> just say the 45th president. So I think for me, it's, it's really a complicated thing. Like everybody, I'm experiencing probably similarly, but I'm trying to sort of navigate without too much distraction. You know what I mean? Like I think it's, it's difficult to, and it's entertaining. So it's hard not to be seduced by you know, a daily kind of a feed of, of stuff. Um, I'm just trying to. You know, I feel like I think what you were saying is right in the sense that of not just piecing something together, but having some kind of clarity or understanding of what you care about and what you believe in. So I guess it's a antithesis. And I think it's. I, I guess I also think like in a way, you know, for me, one of the things I didn't mention in the beginning, out of the kind of abstract expressions thing, that I never really thought of art as communicating anything in particular. I never thought I would be try to communicate something in particular. It was more kind of an experiential thing or something a little bit different than that. And for me now, I feel like I'm trying to find a way to understand, not just to articulate what I feel, but to understand how I feel. Um, so I think that for me, in terms of this time, I am not, um, I am by no means perfect. I am, you know, like how we live and how sort of separate things are. I, I experience that. I'm not, um, I feel like I'm more aware of my own Fault. So I think that's maybe a very good thing. Um, this is on a different subject. Um, 
I, I read that, there, that a reviewer in the Wall Street Journal um, characterized your work as somewhat student-y and that you liked that. And given this environment, I'm wondering if you could explain what it is that you most value about student-y <laughs> art. Well, the, here's the platitude. I'm asking a question rather than giving an answer. And that, to me, is what art is about, that I'm sort of presenting myself with a kind of a question. Um, and I really feel like it's an interesting thing. Like when I was you know, in my 20s, I thought I kind of understood how it was going to go. Like I was going to kind of keep doing what I was doing. But for me, it's been really gratifying to feel like that, that the more I know, the, the, less I, the more I'm aware of what I don't know. And so for me, I've given myself a lot of freedom. And I thought that thing was really beautiful. That meant a lot to me. But the freedom to sort of educate myself on all kinds of levels. Um, and so sometimes it's just basically looking. I mean, I spent a whole year looking at these little David paintings and copying those. And so I feel like that when you educate, when I'm in, involved with what is me asking a question and finding a way to kind of investigate that question, um, I'm finding my teachers in a kind of a pretty broad area. Like in other words, the teachers that I'm looking to are really not limited by time, by anything. Um, and so that kind of idea as an artist that you become a part of, the community is a big community and you can sort of reach into any place and pick it out. There's a guy, his name is Stephen Elcock, and it's on Facebook, and I don't know if you see this, but he posts things every day, the most unbelievable images. He's just an image bank. And I would encourage you to look, and so it's been so, sometimes with my students I do presentations and I just try to show them what I'm talking about by bringing, you know, showing a lot of work of other artists, all kinds of different artists. And it's just really amazing to look at. So I, I love this guy, Stephen Elcock. It's with a PH. But so for me, I feel like that you know, it's really great to be here and not be teaching. It's because it, I teach a lot. And I love teaching. And I, get, you know, and I think like there's something great about talking to people who share your interests. But there really is something else about kind of you just can't be that lazy. Like you have to keep being aware not only of what's going on. You know, I do my best. But I'm, 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 there's so much that I don't know. So I guess for me, that's the goal. And that's not that different from what you're doing in here. That's just like the continued education of your own. Um, it's, it's, yeah. I, and I think there's another thing that I feel like I, I miss out on a little bit that I'm going to do here, which is reading. It's not that easy for me to, you know, it's basically if I'm going to draw or read on that train, I'm going to be drawing on that train. But I feel like reading, too, is another place that you can go to. Sometimes with my students, I don't know if people have read Catcher in the Rye, or when you think about Holden Caulfield, and you think about that's a character that, in some ways, his difference is what allows you to t tap into your similarity to him. So to me, that is the goal of art, is to, in some ways, find a way that you're talking about something that's not limited by your own experiences. Maybe it's particularized by those experiences. So um, yeah, that was, I, you know, in the, the end of that review, which I, is that he said something about, and I, I had to look it up, because he said it in, in a French phrase. And it was something about the, um, he said something like, you, didn't th you, you don't think you could do this anymore, but if you do it well, it can still be done. And what, the word that phrase was something about heightened emotionality about things. And I thought, well, that's really an interesting thing, because that, for me, is really what it is in terms of art and the art that I respond to. Maybe it's funny, maybe it's dark, maybe it's beautiful. But it's always the kind of intensity of emotion that I'm interested in, rather than a kind of um, a distancing. So. Um, this is maybe an extension of Louise's question. I mean, you you um, spoke so eloquently about how these images in your mind, you know, you just kind of go with whatever the images are. And but I wonder if you could say something. I mean, you're such an incredible drawer. If you could say something about your own education in drawing. Well, <clears throat> I think drawing is at the core and the basis of everything. And I teach drawing a lot. And so one of my students, I have them make a little book at the end where they talk about what they think drawing is. And at the end of the course, she said something like, I came into the class thinking that a drawing was taking an image that you had and reproducing it as well as you could. And that what I've learned is that drawing can be anything. So to me, drawing is just thinking and the most direct kind of thinking that you can do. Um, but in some of the work, like the folded pieces, because I love to draw, but in the painting, sometimes the drawing would get buried. And you couldn't see some of the delicateness of the drawing. So some of the things in the bigger pieces are really fun for me, because sometimes when I draw something, I like it like very early on. And so I can allow some of those sort of things to reveal themselves. Um, I think drawing is the most direct means of thinking or taking the thing in your head and taking it out and putting it on a piece of paper. Um, and, I, and I think with drawing, um, I like to draw observationally. And what I, um, 
Deborah Khan is here, and she knows Kajori, I think, or knew Kajori. And talked, he talked about, he gave a lecture about Cezanne. And he said that with Cezanne, the reason that the table tips is because he was looking at one end, and he was making the picture, and then when he got to the other end, that's what happens. It's like as if you blink your eyes. They're like, they don't add up together. And most of the time, we resolve it and make it one image. But for me, I'm more interested in making a notation of my experience as I'm seeing something rather than a picture of something. Um, and I think that that is, becomes even more relevant as pictures become such a, you know, we're so assaulted with pictorial imagery all the time, pictorial and not physical. And so for me, um, like I, I, when I make a drawing, even if I'm looking from observation or not, I kind of let my, I'm in the journey, like I'm not riding the, I'm not driving the car. I'm just participating in this kind of experience. And again, back to that kind of abex kind of, you know, way of looking at things. Um, I'm not, I'm interested in seeing something different than what I thought it would look like. Um, but yeah, it's a, I, I don't know, I, I um, when I teach drawing, I teach with a model. Because I like that as a kind of structure that people can play off of. But most of the time, I emphasize the kind of material, the choices you make in terms of what your material is, and, and that's how the thing gets driven. Drawing is just practicing, really. It's just a very, very pleasurable thing where you suddenly, you know, the kind of feeling that you've kind of, um, yeah, you're not yourself exactly. You've kind of lost yourself a little. You're fully engaged in this thing. So I kind of came up with a kind of strategy for how I could make my drawing the real core of what my, I think that if you could look at this, the things that I showed, in some ways you could say the whole thing as to how to get to the, being, making the drawing the most emphatic part of it. Because I think that is um, something that I really love to do. And I tell you something, because I teach, I never, I'm always scared. I never know what I'm doing when I start. I'm always, I'm always afraid if I do a demonstration, I'm always thinking like, Oh my God, this is a terrible thing. But if you, if you keep going long enough, it starts to actually make, it, it gets better. <laughs> so I think drawing, if you could be less, if you could be, if you can lose the expectation of what you think it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, I mean, I do, I really love drawing. And I, at RISD, where I was a student, that was real, it still is a pretty big core to that, fa to the curriculum. And I think that's true, and I teach people that are all disciplines, but in terms of drawing, you have something in your head, and you want to just show it to somebody, and you can note it down, like a notation of an idea. That's what drawing is to me. Thanks. Great. Anybody else? Thank you, guys. Judy, thanks. Lewis, thank you for coming up and joining us. So maybe we'll see you over there. <laughs>